feel free to go ahead. Rosha, it is recording. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I will be here moderating, but the class is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rosha Georgette. I am the current MOC for the Verity of North Keep and a Bardic Champion for the Verity of Eldred Hills and Discipulous to His Excellency Baron Gishon de Beaumarche. I have been studying period ales and ale making and, and women's studies really from the Middle Ages for about the last 15 years. And uh, there's a handout. Uh, it was posted with the links for the class. I'm, I'm not really sure where all of that's at because I wasn't part of that, but uh, we're going to go over all of the information. So don't feel obligated to have to go get that or anything. It's just there if you want it for keeping notes. The, the topic is this book. It's by Judith Bennett. I don't know. You guys can see that? It's Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England. Women's work in a changing world, 1300 to 1600. I know our period goes back further, but as noted by Ms. Bennett in her book, uh, the prior 5,000 years of brewing was essentially a, a woman's job because in the home, uh, women made the bread and they made the beer. And those two things are generally uh, what would keep people fed and it, it was just a thing. You hit about the 1300s and you start getting into the Crusades and you start getting into um, the, the, the pestilence and the disease of the plagues and the first of the great plagues start coming through. And we lost a lot of we lost just a lot of people. And uh, the process of making ale and beer. Uh, and there's actually a difference. Ale is simply the steeping of um, grain that has been sprouted and dried and then crunched just a little bit. You don't want to make a powder out of it because that'll make your, your steep, it'll turn it into a porridge and not into a liquor that sucks the, the sugars off of the grains. Um, and it's a very detailed process. I, I wanted to understand, and I probably should have made some slides on this. I wanted to understand the level of work that went into making these things. So I went to the feed store right down the road from my house, picked up a $50 bag of barley, which is what everybody makes ale from in, in this period in these places, and brought it home and stuck it in some mason jars and sprouted it for seven days until I had the little tails on the little brains. And then I spread it out on cookie sheets and toasted it at 200 degrees until it was thoroughly dried. And then said, this process is called malting. Uh, and I only did it to about 15, maybe 20 pounds of grain. But once that grain sucks up that water and it begins to sprout, it, it took over my entire kitchen. I, I did not do, but maybe a quarter of this 50 pound bag, I'm, you know, 12, 12 and a half pounds, maybe. And there was enough material that every single surface had a bowl, a pot, a container. And then I did something really stupid. I put paper towel in the bottom of it to keep the water next to the grain so that it would keep it moist because I don't know why I thought it needed that. But the, the roots of the grain, because it grows so fast, grew into that paper towel. So I lost a lot of grain there. Uh, so don't do that. If you, if you want to try the process of malting, I recommend it because it will really give you um, scope and depth on exactly how much work these people were doing. And when I say people, I mean mostly women and children. And I have proof. Um, so they, they would malt the grain. And this is still the process used for making ale and beer today. They just do it on great big grand scales using lots of big heavy equipment. Um, it sprout it, we dry it, toast it, and then grind it. And this is all before you can even steep it. Hi, I don't know who just came in, but welcome. Uh, we're going over Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, Women's Work in a Changing World by Judith M. Bennett. And there is a handout in the links if you want to go get that. Um, so let's talk about how much of this people were drinking. Uh, uh, roughly a gallon a day per person. So all of this malting process that takes seven to 10 days, depending on how warm it is. Remember, they were going through the ice age during this period, too, the little mini ice age. So it was a lot cooler. It's a little, a little bit harder to get those grains to sprout, especially in the wintertime. OK, so you're going to have to use warmed water to sprout those grains because these people were processing this malted 
you know, this making this malted grain, they were processing it every couple of weeks. Okay. So now you've got this great big, huge, massive grain that has to be stirred. You have to stir it up every single day and it has to be sprouted. You know, it's time consuming, it's labor intensive. And this is part of why it was women's work because time consuming and labor intensive, they were given to people who weren't necessarily in charge of everything. And with the advent of the crusades and the plagues, uh, manpower became very, very scarce. Okay. So you started, you started losing guys, you started losing men to crusades, you started losing all of these people. Somebody had to make this beer. And, and, and you say, well, why did they have to? Because they were, they were beginning at the very, very edge of the Industrial Revolution with tanneries and with butcheries, all of these things that people couldn't do for themselves because they just didn't have time. Remember, we're talking labor intensive, heavy work. The tanneries, the, the metal smithing, all of these things, an animal feces alone. And we're, let's not even talk about human hygiene, okay? All of these things were leading into poisoned water, not including the bacteria and all of those things. That I mean, it's just the water was basically death. If all you had to drink was water, you were going to die at some point from dysentery. It was just a fact of life. And so this is, again, why people made ale, all right? They did not realize that the reason the water was safe to drink as ale was because it had been boiled. Next consideration is the ale that they were drinking was not the 6.12 point whatever that we drink today. It did not have that strong alcohol. They were drinking a very mild version of these drinks, 7 to 14 days worth of brewing. That's it. And we're not even talking effervescent. And what's even better is that they thought in, in this period, remember, they thought that in medicinally, the more bitter things were, the better they were for you. So they actually put stuff in their beer to make it bitter. It was called bitters. You can still go to England and buy a glass of bitters when you go to a pub. I always thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so we have these people who they have to have something to drink that's clean. So they're boiling the water, steeping the grain. But then they got into doing things like gruets, and then they discovered hops. You put hops into the ale, it preserves it for a longer period of time, and then it could travel. But that really didn't come into vogue. They didn't really grasp that notion. They would switch between gruet and hops. And gruet could be a mixture of any kind of seasoning packet. I mean, stuff they would get out of the forest, stuff that was in was in uh, season at the moment. And so the flavor of the ale would change literally from one batch to the next in your location, which also which was a very cool thing. Uh, the Pure Beer Acts didn't start really taking effect until the 1500s. So that stuff where they only had one kind of beer with one kind of alcohol content and one kind of everything so that we ended up with the 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 disaster of current well up until you know about 15 years ago when people started doing craft beers and we started reintroducing the flavors and all of these different kinds of things um those things weren't in vogue until the 50 about 500 years of of the simple beer because of the pure beer act okay uh, if you haven't looked that it's uh, in germany in particular uh they said you know if you're going to make beer, it has to have a certain alcohol content made with only these ingredients, and it has to be – it was very stringent and it was very strict, and it was brutally, brutally enforced, like by death. You could you could die from making doctored beer after the 1500s, so that's a whole different subject. We're going to stick between, between about 1300 and 1450, and remember – for 5,000 years, up until about the 1450s, all beer, ale, was made by the lady of the house and her servant girls. And the proof for that, well, it's not really proof, but it's an evidence for it, is in this book. And if you ever get a chance to read it on page 14, uh, there is a uh, excerpt from a woman named Denise Marler. She died in February of 1401, and these are the things that she left behind. This is very interesting to me. One of the things that is not mentioned is a husband, brother, son, 
men in general, okay? Her daughter and her servant Rose, those are who are mentioned. And it says she left behind a thriving brewing business in the town of Bridgewater. She bequeathed the bulk of her business to her servant Rose, half a tenement. That's a building. She left half a building to her servant. Okay. Uh, all of her brewing vessels with a furnace, three sacks full of malt. We just discussed how they made malt. Uh, a cup, a brass pot, a pan, a goblet bound with silver, a chafing dish, two silver spoons, some other carefully specified goods. She also left brewing utensils to other heirs, giving a leaden vat each to her parish church, her parish priest, and two local monasteries. So those are the guys in her life. Monks and priests. Okay. Um, and leaving her daughter, Isabel, two more leaden vats, a brass five-gallon or three-gallon pot, a pan, a mortar and pestle, and the proceeds of one brewing. And that could be a lot if you're talking about, you know, the, the size of, of uh, casks that they would put the brewed uh, ale into. Uh, if, they're, if they're looking at the, the butts and that... I, I never really have studied like the, the measuring system, but we're talking part of the tenement building was used for storage after the making of the brew. So they would make the brew and they would set it aside. And then, you know, five, seven, 10 days, they would be ready to go. And they, whatever the six days before was in there too. And the five days before and the four days before. So you have, you know, a month's worth of beer that's going to be sold or ale is going to be sold to this community over the period. You know, it's, it's a timed business. It is a controlled business. And, and there's another interesting thing on this too. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, let's see. A widow, Denise Marler, enjoyed a very comfortable standard of living thanks in large part to her commercial brewing. And although brewing utensils and supplies made up the bulk of her estate, she bequeathed 80 pounds of white wool, suggesting that she might have supported herself by spinning as well as brewing with several chests of other household goods, coverlets, and other clothing, and a considerable amount of cash. For Denise Marler, brewing for profit seemed to have been a very profitable business indeed. Wow. I mean, in 1401, my perception of women and their work was that we always belonged to somebody else. But it turns out that later on in her research, um, Ms. Bennett shows that 40% of brewers and ale makers of this period were single women who were either widowed or abandoned or in some way alone. And so they had to make their way in the world and figure out how they were going to make a living. And this is how they did it by brewing ale. Um, and the way that the, the reason that they were able to be so successful at it at that time was because of the lack of, if you are a weaver or a, a shearer or a blacksmith, you don't have time to do this level of work, even at the individual basis. And if you're living in a community, London and Paris in the 1400s, even with the plagues and even with the crusades, they had a population of over a million people. What? Yeah, I know, right? Uh, that is a lot of people to have to make ale for. So the Brewster, this person right here, this person right here, that person was a a member of the government. They were the health and human services. They had a chain of office and they had a cup that they carried with them. And they would go around to all of these little able ale makers and tipplers. A tippler is someone who would buy the ale that someone else made and then distribute it in their own facility. And this person would go around and she would try the ale to make sure that it met cleanliness standards, that the facility that it was being made in was clean, that the alcohol content was appropriate and that people weren't poisoning you with stupid things. And, and I'm not even sure what all you could use to poison people in beer, but apparently there were some incidences where people used things they didn't recognize or know. When they put it in the beer, it, it caused some people to die. And I mean, those things were punishable. You know, even if you did it accidentally, they were still punishable. So in the making of the ale, one of the things that women figured out over a very long course of time is that the stronger the alcohol you know, could cause some problems. So what they would do is they would pour the hot water over the mash 
and then they would let it sit for all cold, and then pull that off. That would be a first pull or first draw. On that first draw, they would make beer that was suitable for men. And then they would take in that same grain and they would pour hot water over it again. That would be a second draw. And then that draw was made, made into beer suitable for women and servants. And then the last draw would be used to make beer for children. And I can't prove this. Yeah, yeah. Pine tar, uh, David said that pine tar could be used to cover the flavor of spoiled beer. Yeah, and, and that's just, that's not good for people. Uh, but I, I have a conjecture that the reason that they separated the beer strength is because the results of fetal alcohol syndrome will not, you know, uh, the science of it might not have been understood. The mechanics of it, you know, they kind of understood that, that, you know, it was a socially acceptable thing for women to drink sherry, but not bourbon or hard liquor or, you know, one of those things. And it, generally speaking, we are smaller. Um, but if you're a washerwoman or if you're, you know, there's there's a lot of hard jobs that hard physical labor jobs that women would be doing. But in society, if you were not as labor intensive with your activities, drinking hard alcohol, then they, they saw the results of alcoholism. They saw the results of fetal alcohol syndrome. They couldn't, they might not have been able to tell you why the thing was the thing. But after 5,000 years of practice, we kind of had an idea that there was something going on there. And so I think that that's why that they, they did that, that strength of alcohol. Two interesting things to note, uh, at one point when the Puritans came in and they figured out that they could clean water by boiling it and they banished alcohol from their diet, uh, they caused a famine that caused people to starve to death because while it does provide alcohol, uh, boiled barley producing the sugars provides calories and mineral content that they weren't going to be getting from anywhere else. And when they quit drinking the ale, they starved to death. In, in several areas, uh, all through England. And uh, that too, I believe is listed in Miss Bennett's book. Um, I, I highly recommend it. She taught herself Old English and she taught their, herself their weights and measures and their taxation system. And then she spent 10 years collating data that she published in this book. And it's a, it's a fascinating read. Um, I was absolutely blown away by the, the concept or notion that there were professional women who weren't prostitutes, that the three W's, hookers, wives, and weavers. That's That was the notion that I grew up with for women and women's work in the Middle Ages. That's what you were. And that's it. That's all there was. It, it never even occurred to me that there were professional women doing professional jobs that had standards and that you could or should or would make a living outside the purview or ownership of a family member or a man somewhere. So that's, that's been my study. Pretty close to it. Um, Bjorn says that I can only assume that at the point of doing the third draw, the ale was probably almost to the point of being non-alcoholic. Yes, that is, that is a very true statement especially if the uh, first two draws were allowed to uh, cool completely to room temperature, uh, such that they drew most of those sugars off. And again, the, the point of the ale, uh, we, we figured out later on, wasn't necessarily the alcohol for everybody, but the fact that it was boiled to kill off pathogens and things of that nature that made it safe to drink. So, um, any questions other than the ones already posted? What would you guys like to know about ale making? I don't recommend lead pots. And I don't recommend pewter pots because they're usually made with lead. So if you're gonna if you're gonna try to make a medieval ale, please use modern equipment. Everybody's muted except Damon. I'm just like, what else would you like to know? 
Rosha, would you like me to unmute the room? Yeah, that'd be great. It's kind of like, haha, we got you now. <laughs> So some interesting things that I figured out while making my own ale is that when you're toasting the grain, if you toast some of the grain darker than you toast other parts of the grain, you could make a super pale ale by lightly toasting it, but you can make a really dark ale and porters and things of that nature by, by toasting some of the grain like a really dark color and it imparts a different kind of flavor because the sugars have been toasted. So, I love speaking, porter. I'm not telling you, Founders is my very favorite. They call it porter, but it has hops in it. And technically, if you put hops in it, now it's beer. Bjorn, you had a question? Oh, I was just going to say, um, I guess theoretically speaking, if you were working on making like a more period style ale instead of a beer, just depending on how it is that you toasted it, you could make Guinness. <laughs> In a way. You could, but I've had Guinness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do IPAs either. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm such a beer snob. It's terrible. So, right. Have any of you tried making your own beer or an ale from period recipes? Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> There is a company in Tulsa. I don't know where all of you are from, uh, but if you go online, you can look up High Gravity. They are a um, and a homebrew supply company, High Gravity, and uh, you can actually buy your your malt from them, and you can buy toasted malts. So you can buy the light malts, you can buy the dark malts, so you can experiment with creating different flavors by altering how much sugar and how much toasted sugar you put into your ales when you make them. They have carboys, and then they have some really inexpensive options, and all the way up to the super, you know, great big, huge distillery things that you can do some crazy stuff with. Uh, I recommend them highly. And I think that uh, most major metropolitan areas have something similar. So you just have to look it up wherever you live. But high gravity has been great to me. Um, further south, Austin, Austin Brew Supply, Home Brew Supply is, is the way to go. It, they'll mail you anything. Um, My I, uh, one, two, three. I they have this bag of mystery malt that you can, um, <laughs> it's basically whatever they, they cleaned up from everybody spilling all the, all the stuff. So you get the mix that you would get from toasting the, the barley. Some of it would be darker, some of it would be lighter. And that's what I used right. to make my, log, my lager. Um, and it came out really, really well. I, um, nice. Well done, Tim you. Was, was was very happy with it. It's like, okay, thank you. But yeah, my, my all green. Um, uh, I I've recently seen some videos of uh, the um, sparging tons, uh, lotting tons, whatever you want to call it, uh, with the, with uh, a period wooden false bottom. It it really opened my eyes. Um, if you've never done this before, um, it's a little pricey to get into at first, but uh, it's generally cheaper than making um, making it with uh, with dried malt extract or liquid malt extract uh, after about three or four batches. Also, if you're gonna if you're gonna go with a period technique, uh, of course we've t we've talked about lead lead and pewter wind pots. If you're going to use a straw lined mash tun where you put the grain in and then, or you, you, you put straw at the bottom of it and then you strain your liquor through that straw to get your, your ale, you know, your pre-ale down uh, mm -hmm. off your yeah. grain. 
please make sure that when you buy your straw to put in that, that it's, it's super clean and that you've washed it. And you should also rinse it with several buckets of boiling water, again, to kill off any of those pathogens that might come in from the field. Uh, people don't think about, you know, it's straw. I bought it from the store. It's clean. No, no, it's not. It's straw. It's it was growing like grass just a little while ago. So, and the, and the yeast around here, at least, at least down in South Texas, uh, is not particularly friendly for beer making. No, not at all. So, um, but I mean, this is kind of odd little things that you don't think about when you're using period techniques to do something like this. Uh, washing the straw had would never have occurred to me until I saw somebody go through the process. And there's some great videos online. Have you looked at YouTube and seen, um, what is her name? Uh, Ruth, uh, Tales from the Green Valley is the name of the video series. Yes, that was put out that's through the one I was TV. looking at. Yeah, yeah. They did a whole section on brewing ale. Uh, the Townsends is a, an American colonial uh, YouTube uh, channel, uh, but they have a whole section on brewing ale and making alcohol homebrew. Uh, yeah, all, so there's some very, very, very good visual for visual learners. Uh, there's some great visual people out there who go through this process, and uh, it's kind of like dairy, uh, dairy made. It, if you ever study. Uh, cheese and yogurt and that kind of thing for the period. Uh, the dairy maid was super clean, her hands, her body, her shoes, any kind of anything that she would take into the dairy with her, those odors and flavors would end up in the milk. Same is true with your beers and ales. The person who's making these things are going to be super, super, super clean. And the things that you're making them with are going to be super, super clean. Like they've been boiled, they've been salted. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that that uh, salt is a purifier, and on sunny days, both the dairy and your ale maker, all of their equipment is going to be rubbed down with salt and put out in the sunshine to kill off any of this bacteria that's going to get into your stuff. Use a dishwasher. That's my recommendation. Use, use modern techniques because, you know... We we did we actually made one batch of uh, blackberry wine that we ended up having to pour out the entire batch because we took one sip and we got instant headaches, and we have no idea what it was that got into that batch that caused that reaction, but we didn't even we didn't even try it with anybody else. We just poured it out straight, because I mean, and that's the chances you take by making homebrew. It has not been tested. One of the things that I always teach people during winemaking is keep everything sterile. You may not make a good batch, but you won't make a bad batch. Keep everything <laughs> sterile. Well, and even 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 if you even if you do make a bad batch, it's it's what is it can happen. Um, it's not for a lack of trying because bad batch is a bad batch. It's a terrible terrible waste. Oh my goodness. And on the you know, fermenting oh. vessels. Anyway. A lot of people. I'm sorry. Sir? I'm sorry. Uh, on I the couldn't hear you. Oh, on the fermenting vessels, a lot of people uh, use water jugs. Um, only the glass ones. Plastic ones will allow oxygen to get it and bacteria in. Believe it or not, even milk jugs are not bacteria proof. Nope, they'll leach chemicals out of the plastic too. The alcohol will leach will leach chemicals out of the plastic. You want to use glass. Uh, we have used uh, plastic carboy for a first time brew on beer, uh, but we won't use it for making mead or anything like that or wine. Nope, nope. Nope. Is there I'm, anything about I'm, period I'm, I'm, ale you want to talk about? Yeah. Well, I um, actually had pretty good luck with my with my plastic carboys. Um, the the uh, granted they're the the carboys that you get uh, the you know the water from Walmart, the 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 blue water jugs, 
which are BP uh, free and all that other stuff. Um, yeah, if you're, you're grown, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I can tell you that scientifically, even risky. though you've had good luck because you haven't tasted it, uh, it's still leaching chemicals out of that plastic, and it's a bad idea to keep using them over and over. Okay, but I, I've had I've had pretty good luck so far. More power to you. Uh, the food safe buckets, uh, the food grade uh, buckets that you can brew in a bucket with. I've had um, I've had pretty good luck. Now, food grade plastic, yeah, that's that's a whole different animal. That works. Gruit could be. Uh, we had a, a question about gruit and what it could be made up of. Uh, a gruit is a. Have you ever canned pickles? Have you ever made like homemade, like bread and butter pickles or anything like that? Okay, so um, you've used. I mean. What, what were the spices that were available to the English between 1300 and 1450? Okay, Marco Polo had not got back from China. There might be some stuff from North Africa. You, you might have some cinnamon. You might have clove. You might have, you know, the, the cooking spices. Uh, but they would be expensive, okay? And the more expensive the spice, you know, the more expensive the ale. And so you would be, you know, charging more money for that. So you had to think about that kind of thing. Um, but what would they have locally in their gardens or in the forests near them? Does that make sense? <laughs> Percival, he says that his sage was an experience. <laughs> so, but, you know, uh, better something weird than nothing at all sometimes. And I mean, we, we think about my favorite soda pop is Dr. Pepper and somebody else's favorite soda pop is Pepsi and the ease of which we can go to the convenience store and grab a glass of that uh, at our convenience is, is huge. And I go to my pantry and I've got like thousands of spices, literally, uh, because I'm kind of a spice freak. Um, they're going to have what was locally available, seasonal and appropriate. Yeah. It could be made up of just about anything, which is why they had Brewsters to make sure that people weren't using things that weren't appropriate and could poison people. Yeah, I pulled that sage ale recipe out of um, um, Good Housewife Paris. And um, a lot of your cookbooks will have actual brewing recipes in them. And they're, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, yep. It was... I, I tried to use some sage for my front yard. Maybe that's where I went wrong. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bjorn asked if there were records of ale being made from other things. That's where we get wheat beer. Where they couldn't grow barley, they would be growing wheat. And if you if you take a look at uh, the world, all cultures everywhere made some kind of alcohol. You go to Russia, it's going to be made out of potatoes today. Millet, absolutely. Any kind of grain that had sugar. Uh, but also, uh, of course, the Vikings, they made meat out of honey. Uh, if you go to Asia, where they had a lot of rice, they would make sake and uh, rice-based uh, things. Um, people learned fairly quickly not to make alcohol and drink it made out of wood. You, you ferment the sugars out of wood, you're going to die. I don't know if that's true about maple syrup. I, I don't. I, I have not done any kind of research on that at all. Yeah, we could eat maple syrup. I can't imagine why we couldn't drink maple syrup. Um, but if you make alcohol out of the cells of the actual wood, uh, I, uh, not necessarily on a maple tree, but on other kinds of trees, uh, I don't know what acerglin is. What is that? Acerglin is the actual uh, name for uh, mead made with maple syrup. Oh, well, there you go. It now has, I it know. Has See, name. Did. I'm so happy I did this. Ha uh ha. -huh. I learned something new. I have a book in the 18th century brewery that has recipes for beer where the sugar was maple syrup. Excellent. Excellent. 
So that must mean that there is, there should be some record of it being made because they had maple syrup prior to the discovery of the Americas, didn't they? Because maple trees aren't just indigenous to the continental U.S., are they? No, they I know they're, they're, they're not tree. really sure where they are indigenous to. I, I, for the longest time, thought that they were only in, in the States. No, that's not true. I, I can get, go to my Gerards and find uh, sugar maples. Okay. My, my herbals will have them in there. If they're in an herbal, they're in Europe, aren't they? That makes sense. Yes. All right. How cool is that? I never even thought about it. Now I got a new project to try. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, if it, if it comes out of the kitchen, that's my thing. I cook, I brew, I do herbalism. <laughs> that's my thing. <laughs> that's your thing? Who's talking? It doesn't show up on my screen. Personal. Who was that? Is that David or Percival? That was Percival. Okay. Very cool. Hello. Where Where are you from? I'm down in Bjornsburg now. Um, I've been where? Bjornsburg, San Antonio. Oh, okay. Oh, that's excellent. And you got sugar maples in San Antonio? I'm impressed. No, but I sure have maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I was. I was okay. What what do you look yeah, for? There, if you if you buy after Christmas and in, in the after Christmas sales, you can usually get maple syrup really cheap. Well, that's something I didn't think about. Alrighty. Um also uh there's there's a couple of wholesale uh stores in the neighborhood in in, in San Antonio that you can buy a gallon. Maple syrup, super cheap, and that's pretty much what you need that. to make Acer Glen. Um, okay. I made a I Very made a cool sizer. Cool. I made a sizer um, from apples that I got from your uh, local fruit market, which are there any. Most major cities will have a fruit market. And um, if you press your own, yeah. It, anybody that was at Steps, well, um, Steps Warlord, uh, the one that I actually won, um, that, that, that crap in a barrel, that was my sizer. I made it out of Fuji apples. Did you call it crack in a barrel? No, somebody else called it that shit in the barrel. Have you tried that shit in the barrel? You gotta try that shit in the barrel. <laughs> Seriously, go get some that shit in the barrel. I oh, Lord. It. Are there any references or texts relating to sprouting or mating grains? What do you mean? Okay, so in Malting, the so like I got Let's say, because I got some raw wheat and I've already done some test samples of spreading the wheat, then drying it and using the uh, uh, brew in a bag method to make beer. Okay. So I'm wondering if there's okay. anything out there to kind of help me find what I'm trying to do better. Okay, so this book, uh, Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, is a good start. And what you're doing is that's called malting. Whenever you sprout the grain and then dry it and toast it, that's that's malting it. Uh, the next thing that you should probably consider doing is running it through a very light mill. Uh, you don't want powder because your powder is going to make bread grain. Um, you want it to be cracked wheat. You want it to be that, that shell to be opened up so that when you add your hot water to it, it can steep those sugars out of the grain. So yeah, as far as, uh, hang on just a second. Okay, um, I, I, I'm going to interject just a little bit. The reason that beer is made from barley is because 
Uh, when you sprout the barley, it has a very high concentration naturally of amylase, which is what breaks down the, the, the um, complex carbohydrates uh, into the simple sugars that the yeast can eat. So when you're malting uh, other grains, you have to use at least some barley to get the amylase to make it work. At least that's okay, so been what's the difference my experience. It's, it's very prevalent in barley, not so much in wheat, right. definitely not in corn. Yeah, you're going to make liquor out of corn. You're not going to make a beer or an ale out of corn. It's a different animal completely. Uh, I, I didn't know about the amylase. I will have to read up on that, but it doesn't it doesn't seem unreasonable. So anyway, this is another book. I don't know. Can you all see it? It's called Nutritional or Nourishing Traditions. Nourishing Traditions, and it's by Sally Felton with Mary Enig, and it's it's got a lot of stuff in here, but it talks about using grain, uh, crushed grains, to preserve meat, and how in some uh, Middle Eastern countries they will take raw lamb and they will gr uh, grind and crush grains and then mix it with that raw meat and make a meatball that they will that and let it sit because the sugars in the grain will chemically cook the meat and it will ferment and it will do all kinds of crazy stuff but the meat's not cooked and a lot of places in the middle east don't have like a lot of wood and they'll they'll use animal dung for heat and that sort of thing but you don't cut trees down for a forest fire or a, a campfire or whatnot. Um, yes, yes, Bjorn, it is almost like dry aging, but it will be done by mixing those grains with it. Now, okay, so completely different study that I did was on um, figgy pudding and pasties. Uh, originally, all of that stuff started out again by mixing things with sugar, fruit, grapes, currants, Kibbeh, yes, yes, Percival, that is exactly the word. Uh, but meat pasties and those kinds of things started out when they would butcher the animals and they had leftover pieces of meat that they weren't smoking, curing, canning, in some way preserving. They would take those bits of scraps of meat and mix them with dried fruit. And that dried fruit, the sugar from that dried fruit would preserve that meat. Again, this is a... Uh, um, Ale is a means of food preservation. Uh, once you grind grain and it becomes flour, uh, you, you kind of got to use it fairly soon because it's going to spoil. It's going to go bad. Uh, you can keep dried grain for a long time. Um, but once it's ground, you got to do something with it. But the, the biggest issue with ale and beer is to have something clean to drink because you cannot drink the water. So it's a process that you would go through. Um, where was I going with that? Good grief. Now, this is a huge topic of study to have to concentrate into just a, an hour's discussion. Um, and we could go down every kind of rabbit hole you want to. I mean, um, we could, you know, look up little sections of England and figure out what kind of spices they were using as their grit in that little spot in that little time period. But it was going to change again rapidly because their growing seasons changed, water changed, the little ice age changed, you know, and then they were finding new places to get stuff from. You could have ale that tasted like just about anything. You know, you were talking about the ale being used because people wouldn't drink water we were visiting a cloister in Germany and we saw this rack full of five liter um, mugs. That was the monk's daily ration of beer. So now we know why the monks are always depicted as fat and happy. <laughs> Absolutely. But again, still, so that beer was made over a period of seven to 14 days. 
and it was done. It did not have the alcohol content that we have today. <laughs> huh. You know, I am going to have to look that up about the amylase thing, because I, I really, in, in all the stuff that I've been reading, I, it's never come up as a topic of discussion that I'm aware of. It might have, but I just kind of right over it. Oh. I mean, they don't have amylase in rice, and they make sake in in Asia. Um, and I mean, are they going to have are they going to have barley in wheat beer in Germany? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. Have have a Weissen. Weiss beer. Weiss, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the reason I asked right. that question is because we did the um, malting and all that and had three uh -huh. runs of 100% wheat beer. They've all turned out different. And yep. I was wondering if all I could find for how to do it was if it's barley. So I was wondering if that's why I asked if there was any other text out there that's not mainstream that may help me provide a way to repeat the process consistently. Probably your best bet for consistency uh, is to buy commercial malts. Go to go to the place in San Antonio. Go to High Gravity. Um, you know they have some very specific uh, tests that they do for sugar content, for uh, level of toasting on the grains, those kinds of things. Your consistency of product will give you a consistency of beer from one batch to the next. Uh, everything else is going to be kind of, you know, it's going to be different every time, especially if you're bolting your own. And that's because you're not using equipment to, it's kind of like this. Do you know when, have you made a lot of bread? Have you baked a lot of bread? Uh, just throwing flour together with some uh, emulsifiers and some liquid. Okay, so when do you know it's done baking? Uh, usually when those are the inside uh, is no longer wet and the crust is uh, golden on top. Okay, but how do you test that? Uh, toothpick or some kind of uh, metal rod to go in. Or by smell. I can usually tell when a loaf of bread is done baking by the strength of odor coming from the oven when it's baking. And the only reason I can do that is because I've baked thousands of loaves of bread. The same is going to be true for these ale makers. They start making ale. If you remember when uh, Denise Marlar, when she died, she gave the brewing, uh, the proceeds of one brewing to her daughter, Isabel, and her entire establishment to her servant, Rose. So how old were these people when they started brewing ale? If it's passed from mother to daughter, they had been in close contact with the processes of making this, this drink literally from birth. So it would be something that they would be as familiar with as they would be their own face. They knew when the malt was done growing. They knew when it was ready to toast. They knew what condition it was in when it got toasted and how long to toast it for to make different flavors of ale. And that is why they were professionals because they knew when things were done by smell, by color, by texture, and by taste. They didn't have to have a whole lot of scientific equipment. It's just because they had made literally thousands of batches of these things over the course of their lifetime. They did not need all of this equipment to make sure that they had a consistent thing from one set to the next. Pottery ceramic vessels uh, for putting your brews and ales in, they're great. They're going to be heavy. Uh, they're going to be heavier than glass because clay is heavy. Uh, you can absolutely use it and it can absolutely be sterilized so long as they don't have cracks. If you start developing cracks in your ceramics, you cannot sterilize them anymore because you can't get, you can't make sure that your, your ceramic is getting hot enough to sterilize that seam between the, the cracks in the glass. 
That's why you don't use cracked glass for making pickles and things of that nature either. Which is which is hysterically funny to me because um, my wooden bread bowl. Okay, thanks, Callie. Uh, we got five minutes. My wooden bread bowl is not something that I will wash or sterilize. I will throw my flour and my yeast and all of my stuff into my my wooden flour bowl or my wooden bread bowl. I will mix that stuff up and I'll let it set. And that yeast will infuse that wood or infect it. You can use that word. You can use that yeast to infect that bowl. So you're going to get the same yeast over and over and over and over again. So I know. Uh, maybe it's because you're cooking the bread and it's a cooked product when you eat it versus uh, a, an intentional fermentation where you're deliberately trying to grow a yeast in a thing that you're going to consume a living organism, it makes the difference. In in my opinion, that's probably why you can do those things that way. But on the other hand, they did pickling via uh, salt water brine, which um, in which suppressed certain kinds of yeast and fungi and allowed other yeast and fungi to grow. And that was a living bacteria as well. Again, smell, look, taste, all of those things played a role in how sauerkraut, kimchi, all of those things, those are fermented foods, eaten raw, you know, cook those things. Uh, you ate the bacteria because that's what made the food the food. Cheese, oh my gosh. And then for boiling the mash. They would usually be, uh, he asked what the tubs for boiling the water for the mash. Again, remember she said she gave a leaden lined pot to her parish priest and to her monastery, the local monastery. Um, lead was easy. It was soft. It was, it wasn't tin. Um, yeah, pewter was made pliable by adding lead to it. Or you would put the water in or you would put the mash in and it would leach those chemicals out of it. That's that's you know one of the pitfalls of medieval cookery and, and boiling and making beer and such. They just didn't know. They had the money for it. I mean, bronze, copper, iron, those are expensive metals. And if you consider, um, even though they were coming out of the bronze age, uh, a lot of weapons were still made of copper and bronze. And copper and bronze were used to accentuate uh, a lot of weapons. And remember, they're going on crusades. They're making implements for farm use. Uh, only the very wealthy are going to use um you know, copper and bronze and things of that nature for cooking utensils, and they're soft. Remember, copper and bronze will melt in a uh, typical campfire. They're very soft metals. Uh, as far as iron is concerned, uh, I'm sure that there were iron pots and pans. Um, again, I don't know that they were very common. Um, now, I have been studying blacksmithing um, I know how expensive iron is right now. And I know how expensive iron was to make back then. And even if you mixed it with nickel or something else to make it more pliable so that you weren't just making pot metal, um, it was still going to be a catch as catch can of whether or not you were successful at smelting it. And then who's going to have the money to afford that? Pewter and lead, those things people could afford, you know, a little better. Yeah, for the most part, you could you could usually in especially in northern Europe and as in uh, Michigan and parts of uh, the, around the Great Lakes, you can find copper laying on the ground. It, yeah, lumps of copper. There's evidence. There's evidence of uh, of uh, oh the Phoenicians coming over uh, over the northern bridges uh, and going to the Finger Lake regions and. Digging up copper and tin and, and other metals up there. Yep. Yeah, Columbus was definitely not the first guy here. Uh, 
So, well, folks, it looks like we're about to wind down. Um, is there anything else that y'all can think of that I might be able to help you find an answer to? Generally, for a five-gallon batch, how much how much malt do you use for for an all-grain five? It depends on the recipe. You're going to have to look at your recipe. Because I usually go about nine to anywhere between nine and twelve pounds. Ten's kind of happy medium. Yeah, and that then sounds about right. About, but... I wind up with about a five or six percent beer. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, not a lot. There are there are some um, in. Uh, or you just have to go through it. Yeah. Um, it just talks about it talks about contents and things of that nature. So. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, looks like our room is going to be taken over here in just a moment. So, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you all for coming.